The bottleneck in our country's beef supply is often considered to be with the packing industry. And in the last couple of years, that truly has been exposed, which brings us to our topic for today. That's a group of ranchers that came together and are building Sustainable Beef LLC. It's a 1,500-head packing plant in North Platte, Nebraska. Um, it was a pipe dream at the beginning. But a good friend told me, you know, it's just a bunch of cowboys that wouldn't quit. Trey Wasserberger, co-founder and rancher, joins me as we discuss how this came from pipe dream to reality. What were the issues in those early meetings? How did they gather the capital and how they handled the many challenges that are part of a project of this scope, including environmental and climate conversations? This carbon footprint conversation is very at the forefront of the packing industry because the retailers are asking for it. And what about those that they have partnered with, including Walmart? For them to come forward as a minority uh, shareholder, they wanted not only the quality of beef, they want to improve their meat case and be one of the retail leaders in uh, high choice and prime Angus beef on their shelf that's raised by ranchers. Sustainable Beef LLC, a producer-owned packing plant in Nebraska, is our top story on this edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome you here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We thank you for joining us here on our program today, a topic that uh, I think you're going to find interesting, mainly because a lot of us have, have had those conversations about, well, we just need more packing space out there, and maybe we ought to just start one up or do something on our own or have our own branded beef product. Well, we're going to be talking about Sustainable Beef LLC, and it came together with a group of ranchers, just basically had a lot of things that happened in the marketplace, and like, man, we need to do something about it and so they came together and starting and building in the process now of building a 1500 head packing plant in north platte nebraska trey wasserberger is going to be my guest here today he's one of the co-founders and a rancher as we talk about everything from how that initially got started those conversations how they've built capital some of the challenges that that they're dealing with and all of the just a lot of things in that that i think will be very informative for a lot of folks uh you probably heard about this, maybe not uh, have heard it to the detail that we're going to talk about today. So uh, join us today, Trey Wasserberger, co-founder and rancher with Sustainable Beef LLC, joining us today as we talk about the startup and the building of that facility in North Platte, Nebraska. Of course, meteorologist Don Day will be joining us here at the end of the program as we'll get a look at our long-term weather. You know, and speaking of weather, it is that time of the year. If you're trying trying to winter on that old dried up grass, you're going to need some sort of supplement well that reminds me here you know new generation supplements is celebrating 25 years this year and they have over 2,000 dealerships all across the U.S. and Canada now don't say that so you think oh man they're just a large feed company and they can't do anything uh, for us specifically that's not the case because they still know that they have a lot of different folks all across the country whether it's Texas or up in South Dakota or Missouri down in Florida California whatever They know that not everybody's the same. So they have over 70 unique formulas between their three livestock brands. And you know them as Smart Lick, Feed in a Drum, and Mega Lick. They're not a fad-based company. They just don't do things on on just a a whim. They sell what is proven to improve cattle performance and help animals reach their genetic potential. Check them out. New Generation Supplements, research-driven, field-proven supplement solutions. Find out more at New Gen supplements.com and right now a shout out to our sponsors of the working ranch radio show zenpro avela 4 allow your cows and calves to perform to their full potential with zenpro avela 4 and the american simmental association heterosis works which is why with simmental it's more per head period find out more at simmental.org and gain smart mineral by biozyme increase pasture utilization with the amifirm advantage found in all Gain Smart Minerals. Find out more at Gainsmart.com. And Performance Ranch. Don't keep your cow calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch. Find out more at Performance Livestock Analytics.com. Well, right now, let's check in with the captain, publisher, and editor of Working Ranch Magazine for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. 
Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. Now, this is from Senator Cory Booker's website in the news this week. Booker announces legislation to hold large factory farms accountable and improve animal welfare. Legislation would require industrial operators to prepare for disaster events and utilize more humane practices. U.S. Senator Cory Booker, Democrat, New Jersey, announced the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act, legislation that would place the liability for responsible disaster mitigation on corporations and industrial operators by requiring those entities to register with the USDA, submit disaster preparedness plans, and pay a fee to establish a fund focused on disaster events. This new fund, the High Risk AFO, meaning Animal Feeding Operations, Disaster Mitigation Fund, will be utilized to enforce disaster mitigation plans and ensure that the most humane practices are used if depopulation is absolutely necessary. So, I get it. I think we're on this already um, as an industry. But what concerns me here, folks, I want you to go to their website, his website, and check the list of supporting organizations. There's about 57 of them, and I checked a few of them out. And I'll tell you what, I want those of you that are up on all this stuff to have a look at that and just kind of keep an eye on the, I would say, the um, direction of travel that this uh, proposal is going and how it can lead the way for others. That's my two cents. Back to you, Mr. Mills. All right. Thanks, Captain. You know, and as you were talking about uh, the, all of that business taking place there in Washington, D.C., it's important that we get involved. And this week, there's a way you can be a part of that process, and that is by heading to Nashville, Tennessee, as the U.S. Cattlemen's Association will be having their 15th annual meeting and Cattle Producers Forum. It'll be downtown Nashville this week, December 8th through the 10th. If you want to go for the whole week, you can, If you or for the whole time, you can. If you want to go just for a day, you can register. Go to their website at uscattleman.org and you can get uh, signed up and registered for the U.S. Cattlemen's Association's annual meeting this week in Nashville, Tennessee, December 8th through the 10th. Well, real quick, before we head to break, I did want to remind you about Hydrobed, their original bale bed. They have produced their 20th thousand, yeah, 20,000 Hydrobed, and that commemorative Hydrobed will be sold on Big Iron. It is there now, and you can go check it out. All the proceeds going to help raise money and awareness for kids with type 1 diabetes check it out it's on big iron and that will be closing on december 21st well stay with us coming up next we're going to be talking sustainable beef llc that packing plant being built in north platte nebraska we'll be back with trey wasserberger after this Starting off in the right direction is essential to gaining an advantage later when you go to market your calves. And I have proof that the right direction is with Sim Angus Sired Calves. A 2020 study by K-State showed that Sim Angus Sired Steer Calves earn more at sale time than all other breed identified sire groups with at least 50 lots represented on Superior Livestock's 2020 summer sales. The proof's right there. For low-risk, high-potential calves with earning potential, be confident that Sim Genetics will give you more per head, period. Stand strong, Simmental. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills as we head now into our featured interview. And uh, I'm pleased to have Mr. Trey Wasserberger, who is a co-founder of Sustainable Beef and a rancher out of uh, North Platte, Nebraska. And uh, Trey, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Yeah, Justin, thanks for having me on. So the the whole element of of what we're going to be talking about here today with sustainable beef really goes back to one one bigger factor out there and and that is that we really did see when covid-19 hit we did see a, a really some of the dark spots of our beef chain supply chain really come into light. And I think uh, that in addition to the fact that we know that a lot of our packing industry is controlled by four major packing companies and a lot of that just kind of the perfect storm just developed and you guys said, okay, we got to do something about this. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of little uh, events that happened and a few big ones that why we all got into this and um, all for for the same reason. And that was to add packing capacity. And uh, it added more than that. I mean, you know, this got started in uh, clear overseas with the governor Ricketts and another co-founder, Rusty Kemp. And they started talking about how we can fix this and bring back. Um, really, the talk was in getting packers to reinvest uh, money back into rural America. You know, it's very, very hard a lot, you know, when it's control, you know, when four companies have 85 to 90 percent of the packing capacity, um, that money leaves rural America and it's hard to get it back. And this was just our um, small fix for our, our regional problem with, uh, you know, with all our co-founders and families and farmer feeders that are involved with us. And, and also it turned into a major, major event for our community. And it, um, you know, Dr. Ernie Goss from Creighton did our feasibility study, which we um, completed. And it's a $1.15 billion impact for the North Platte community. And uh, that's, that's insane. I mean, we don't get to use the word billion with <laughs> very often. And so that was a huge deal for the community. And they've really embraced the project. And they've wanted this, and we've got the site, and we we've broken ground. Uh, I think we broke ground October fourth, and and uh, we're getting about four hundred loads of dirt in a day right now. So mm-hmm. it, it's going well. Mm-hmm. It's going very well. Trey, I I might have got the cart a little bit ahead of the horse here because we jumped right into what what's going on here. Uh, and let's back up and let's let's start from. And you talked a little bit about that as as far as just the issues at hand that made this all start to happen. But first of all, what we're talking about is Sustainable Beef LLC. And so, who's a part of this deal? Yeah, so there's about seven founders that are involved with Sustainable Beef, and. Uh, um, three um, cattle feeding families um, are involved. Uh, obviously, me and my father-in-law Kirk Olson, and then uh, Pete and Cassie Lapisotis, and then Bob Maxwell, uh, Rolling Stone feeders, and they're all within 200 miles of the plant in North Platte. And also our CEO David Briggs, he's really done the heavy lifting. He he owns and operates, or he operates a co-op in um, Alliance called Wesco in Western Nebraska. Um, he's just He's a hard worker. He's a workhorse. He's he's a great leader, and he, and we wouldn't be here without him. And also Bill Jackman, who's from Grant, Nebraska, for, uh, originally. As you might know, he was a basketball player, played for Duke, later on in the NBA. And, uh, yeah, and then also our last and final founder was a very, very important piece of the puzzle, and that's uh, Mr. Bill Rupp. Uh, Mr. Bill Rupp is a um, former CEO of Cargill Beef Business and JBS Swift. Um, lives in um, Loveland, Colorado. We wouldn't be here without him. We originally had him as a consultant early on. Obviously, a bunch of cattle feeders trying to build a packing plant. It's like trying to build a rocket ship to Mars is what I compared to. And we went out and hired the best guy we that was available at the time. That was Bill Rupp. And he believes in this uh, project so much that he invested as a founder and, and sits on the board. And, and um, he's really, really him and his team, Brian Dirksen and and Jeff Smith, both are retired from Cargill as well. One is an engineer and one's an operations guy. Um, they're in the process of designing the plant now. And it's really, really cool because these guys all are formally from the big four in some way or form. Mm-hmm. But they've always been told to, here's a building, um, make it work, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and process four, five, six thousand head a day and kind of retrofit it, you know, the big major plant that most of our fat cattle go to down the road um, was an old combine facility, combine harvester uh, facility where they built combines and they retrofitted it to kill 5,000 head a day now. And that's just, you know, that's incredibly hard. So um, this, this team, um, Bill Rupp and, and Brian Dirksen and Jeff Smith are really um, having a lot of fun with this and designing it how they want to. And they've actually used the quote, um, if they could ever have built a plant uh, while they were, um, in their former positions, they'd had it in North Platte, Nebraska. Yeah. And that's kind of how this all kind of worked. It was a lot of small events, right? Um, mm-hmm. A friend of a friend introduces <laughs> us and, and all of a sudden we got some, some North Platte people involved and they, so the cool part about North Platte is we can hit either border, Canada or Mexico um, in about 12 hours in a truck. Mm-hmm. And also we can hit uh, each coast 
about 24 hours in a truck. So, you know, Central America, and let's not forget, there's three C's to this, um, basically to this project. And one is city, um, the site, of course, which is huge, having a community that wanted this kind of economic impact. And next is cattle. And of course, um, no secret about Nebraska. And uh, we quote ourselves from being in the, the, beef, the beef state, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's agriculture is our state's largest industry and the beef industry generates like $10.6 billion in cash receipts per year, which is half of the state's entire receipts. So it's a huge business here. Number one in the nation for commercial cow slaughter, number two for beef exports, commercial red meat and total cow herd. And uh, so it was just a very great place to build a packing plant. And so we got together, it started, you know, and, and basically in August of 2020, which I'll take you back you know, we, we all remember what happened. I still mm-hmm. remember uh, the why of this project. And one of the major whys was August 9th, 2019. And that was the Holcomb fire. And um, I was on my way to the summer video, Western video um, there in Cheyenne. And, and uh, we saw the board drop the limit uh, one day. And then we saw it drop the limit again the next day. And um, on sheer panic, and you know, it was a fire that calls the fire that caused minimal volume losses. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, beef production like we were shipping cattle to different places. Um, Tyson did a very, very good job of dictating where these cattle would go. Um, you know, it was one of the largest plants. I mean, it was an electrical fire in the Holcomb plant, which is uh, one of seven plants that can harvest 6,000 head a day. So that's a big hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's only one other plant that's bigger than them, and that's Dakota City, another Tyson plant that kills about 7,000. The inter- interesting part was uh, the Holcomb fire was when it, the aftermath of it, of sheer panic on both sides as cattle feeders and as, uh, as, as packing packers, it really didn't move the needle much. I mean, the week after the fire, they, they killed a very, very large amount. I mean, they started killing on Saturdays and, and had huge kills coming out of it. I think the last week of August, you know, three weeks after it, after the plant was shuttered, they killed 644,000 head, uh, which is the same number as this in the, as the same week the year before. So really did it have, uh, did it really uh, disturb the market like we thought? No. Uh, the Packers did a good, really, really good job getting these cattle filled, but it completely panicked the CME yeah. and market out. And so I've always remembered that. And then that was in 2019. And what happened in 2020? Here came yeah. a pandemic global yeah. pandemic and um i mean completely disrupted the packing industry uh they were really one of the if you remember in the news that spring uh they were really one of the mate you know in march and april of 2020 they were really one of the major industries hit because of close confinement you know there's a lot of reasons why but um close confinement in the plant and also colder air uh, allows the back you know the virus to live longer and it was just uh, panic in the streets on mm-hmm. all account. I mean, shelves were empty. Uh, we couldn't get cattle in everywhere. I was sourcing fat cattle all to places I never even could imagine. But uh, packing capacity was huge. And, you know, like you said, it was a perfect storm. And you got an overabundance of cattle and small kills and COVID running rampant. And I read the other day, it was like, it, it disturbed the market. Now this is real. This is a real disruption of the market. It cost the mark, the beef industry, like $11.2 billion is what it came out to after, uh, according to a study by a, a professor from the university of Arizona. So that tells you the disruption that we saw and, you know, it, it was a problem. Yeah. Trey Wasserberger is my guest here today. We're talking about the Sustainable Beef LLC, a packing plant that's uh, in in the process of being currently built right now. When we come back, we're going to continue. we got a couple more segments where we're going to talk about that. Specifically, we're going to talk about some of those early meetings with other ranchers like he, like he and some of the other co-founders, as well as some of the design of this uh, new plant, uh, some of the newer technology that they can incorporate in into that. And uh, we're going to talk about those things when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. 
Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to performancelivestockanalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here as we're talking about Sustainable Beef LLC. And it's a packing facility that's getting started up here that has been founded and started by ranchers. My guest here today is Trey Wasserberger. He is a rancher out of North Platte, Nebraska. And Trey, I introduced you in the first segment. We really didn't get a lot of details uh, about you specifically, but we do know that Sustainable Beef was, you know, as a rancher yourself, several other ranchers and, and feed operators, part of this whole deal. A a little bit about your operation td angus yeah so uh our family is um basically you know conception to um all the way to the packer today um we will we will sire the cat or the bull calf raise it here south of north Platte, nebraska our family ranch it goes out we have an annual bull sale in march sell about 400 bulls a year to about 30 different states they go out sire the calves uh, we and we try to buy those calves back to fill our family feed yard, and then uh, you know raise the corn that we feed the cattle. Cattle go all the way to the packer, and uh, now uh, we have broken ground on Sustainable Beef LLC, which is a producer-owned packing plant here in North Platte, Nebraska, um, just five minutes from our main feed yard, and so that will be complete the cycle from uh, conception to consumer. Mm-hmm. Trey, when you were talking in the first segment about uh, not only some of the ranchers and the feed yards that are part of this uh, this sustainable beef, but also some of the other folks that you've incorporated in this deal, the thought that was going through my head is how did those just first initial meetings and conversations happen? Because I'll tell you what, you guys you guys bit off a pretty big a wad here of, of stuff. I mean, we're talking about, you know, a $325 million uh, facility that's being built here. And that's not something that you just start, start up overnight. And there's a lot that's behind that. And so just the feelings and the mentality between the conversations that were happening when you guys were sitting across the table from each, each other saying, here's what we need to do. What was that feeling like? Yeah. So, you know, like I said earlier in the first segment about the COVID-19 and, and all and the disruption of the beef supply chain and it, this cattle feeding world's small. I mean, uh, you talk about 85 to 90% of the packing capacity being owned by four um, multi corporate, multi uh, national corporations. Well, the cattle feeding world is just the same. I mean, we're knocking out these thousand head feeders um, and the bigger getting bigger. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know, during 2021 when times were tough enough every cattle feeder i knew like four or five that were pouring bunk Mm -hmm. and expand in a tough time i mean the bigger getting bigger in ag and uh so it was a small world and it's funny i look back at the way we handled it we were so quiet for a year (laughs) i mean we met behind closed doors blinds we as cattle feeders we were terrified of retaliation yeah. And we were doing business every day with the big four and we didn't want to get out that we were after um, their business. And as this company grew and um, innovated, we aren't after their business at all. I mean, my favorite saying is from John Keating, who was a former CEO of Cargill. And he said, Trey, you've got a great idea and a great story here, but um, the packing pie is already full. And, and you need to you need to not go after their piece of the pie. You need to make your own piece. Mm-hmm. And I've always remembered that. And that's what we've done. And this is different. I mean, and like you said, you bit, you took off a big bite. Well, when we first started this, we wanted to be 500 heads. Yeah. And uh, the economies of scale, just with our, with our Cargill, uh, former Cargill team, we just couldn't make it work. I mean, we're at a disadvantage already. Um, with with inefficiencies of of yield and um so we had to bump up to a thousand head and we're like wow i mean that's a big deal and all of a sudden we needed more cattle and more feed yards just to subscribe and buy shackle space and then as everybody knows on this um show inputs and and inflation and construction costs have just completely gone the wrong direction and now all of a sudden we got to be 1500 head to be at the same number as we thought at 500 head two and a half years ago, and we're double the price um, of the plant. 
And so it's amazing what this team has done. Um, it was a pipe dream at the beginning, but a good friend told me, you know, it's just a bunch of Cowboys that wouldn't quit. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've swallowed it. We've, we we're going to have to get a little bigger and costs have skyrocketed, but we've managed to get through it and uh, we're going to get a bill. So, mm -hmm. well, and no doubt as this has happened, you, t you look at all the factors that, that developed this idea and brought this about. And then we add in the fact that we've got inflation going on and other elements. There's, there's probably a never an ending list of things that uh, you have to kind of wrap your head around and figure out how we're going to get through this. Let's look at the specifics of this plant real quick. We've already talked a little bit about capacity. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, you talked about some of your partners in this that are, are former or execs out of some of the big fours and saying, man, if they could build the perfect plant, here's what they would do. Because this is going to be a buildup. It's not a retrofit of another building. What's this building and the technology involved in it? What's that all going to look like? Yeah, so that's an evolving um, discussion too. Let's just be very, very upfront about this carbon footprint conversation is very at the forefront of the packing industry because the retailers are asking for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I tell all my customers, well, my, my favorite line, I'm not going to tell you who, what retailer told me, he <laughs> said, well, do we believe in climate change? The answer is yes. The climate changes every day, but we don't know what causes it. The, the world is billions of years old. I don't want to use a hundred years of data to dictate what's happening in this climate, but it is for real. Climate does change every day. And I love that. I'm like, yeah, it does. But our retailer and our consumer are telling us they want to know that we are conservationists. Uh, we are regenerative agriculture specifically and sustainable. And our, our claim as a company is not, you know, sustainable beef. We're going to be sustainable. Sustainable beef is a pledge that we have been. I mean, there's some hundred year old ranches involved in this thing. And we're proud of that. Mm -hmm. That's sustainable. And that, so we get into the weeds as uh, an industry with retailers and consumers about what sustainability means. Well, sustainability, are you profitable or are you not? Is, is that's what it is to us. And, and this is our pledge that we are, and we want to do better for our community and we want to do better for our industry. And so our cargo team has taken this and it's, it's the technology and the automation involved. Um, you know, we're, we're going to save a lot on yields because of, uh, of AI and automation today, um, we're going to be able to track um, a whole carcass as it's, di you know, this, this is what I love. Like, there's not a lot of businesses out there that are in the disassembly business. Like, mm -hmm. everybody's in manufacturing is in the assembly business. Well, that's not, this is different. You're taking a whole piece and making it into hundreds. Well, we've, we, we're developing and, and, and part of a company that is going to be able to take pictures of the muscle fiber and be able to, as we deconstruct this carcass, we'll be able to follow that, you know, that primal or that grind or whatever and, and dictate it out where it came from, where it started from. And so there's a lot of technology involved. I mean, let's just be very serious about the problems this company faces. Number one, easily could be labor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, North Platte, Nebraska right now has like 45 homes on the market and we're bringing in 850 new jobs. And then Ernie Goss came out and said, well, sustainable beef is going to employ 850 people, but you're going to bring about 2,000 jobs auxiliary business-wise, you know, with rendering and um, cold storage, trucking. I mean, it's a whole nother beast off the plant site. So where are these people going to live and, and how are you going to pay them? I mean, and I told this to the guy the other day, he's like, how are you going to, how are you going to get these people to come to North Platte? The median wage in North Platte is $28,000 today. Mm -hmm. Our starting wage at the plant is going to be probably pretty close to 60000 hmm. That tells you two things about your economy in North Platte. It's not healthy, and it's starving. If, if, you're, if your median wage is $28,000, um, that's below the poverty line in America today. And that's your median wage. That's just saying your median in North Platte is below the poverty line. We need this kind of economic impact. And so we're, we're, we're going to be a, a greenfield startup plant. We're going to be one shift too. We're pretty proud of that. We're we're not going to have a night shift. Um, these, you know, our our new employees are going to be able to get there early in the morning and hopefully get off in time to go to the ball game or you know go, go to their dance practice or take their kids to soccer practice. And it's going to be one shift. We're not going to have to work at night. And it's going to be spread out. You know, it's a beautiful thing. 
COVID is a silver lining for a lot of things. And, and yeah, it put us on this track to get this plant built, but it also helped us set it out too. We're very, very spread out. Um, a lot of the problems in packing plants today is the flow of traffic and where they spend their time on the break room. And that's kind of where, uh, you know, people are contracting the virus. So we're actually being able to flow um, Temple, Dr. Temple Grandin is helping us with this actually, not just cattle, but the flow of the plant, people exit out one way, come in the other and you know, it, it won't loiter as much. So we're going to have a new equipment, which is going to be, you know, this is a hard work. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the median, the median age of a plant worker is 28 years old. And so that tells you one thing, it takes a young, able, uh, human that's willing to work hard. And these are long days, long hours and monotonous. And, uh, so we're, we're going to retrofit it. So, and have all the cutting it, make it easier on them, have a day shift and pay them and take care of them. Mm-hmm. And so that's our plan. And, uh, we've stuck to that and it looks that way too. And the Cargill boys are really excited. They get to do some things they've never been able to do. They've talked about, that's the problem with the big four today. I mean, they want to change, but they can't stop production. Mm-hmm. So, do they just shutter the doors? I mean, some of them do for a cleanup or, you know, maintenance, but to revamp their entire kill floor or to revamp their, their ground beef room, it can't, they can't do it with six, five, 6,000 hit in a day coming six days a week. They, they just can't get that done. And so this Cargill team's like, wow, we've always wanted to do this at this plant, or we've always wanted, you know, I was in there with one of the, I was talking to one of the guys and he was talking about the pitch in the floor, just being off a degree. So it drains correctly. I mean, just little things that they just want to, that they, they've never been able to have a greenfield startup and build it from the ground up. So we're really excited and really proud of our team and for being innovative. And, and uh, it'll be something to see eventually. Mm-hmm. couple of years. You bet. Trey Wasserberger, he's one of the co-founders and a rancher out of North Platte, Nebraska, joining us today. We're talking about sustainable beef, and we're going to take a break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about one additional partner that showed up here as part of this uh, in, a, in a minority stake in August of this last year, we're going to, and that being Walmart. We're going to talk about how that came about and uh, continue with a little bit more discussion about the Sustainable Beef LLC, a packing facility opening up in North Platte, Nebraska here in a couple of years. We'll get to it. When we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Aid stressed cattle during weaning, shipping, receiving, and vaccination by delivering a multi-day supply of essential minerals and nutrients. With Zinpro Profusion Drench, you can keep receiving calves performing and achieve a 16 to 1 return on investment with 20% reduced respiratory loss. Optimize performance from the start with Zinpro Profusion Drench. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today, Trey Wasserberger. He and his wife, Dana, are ranch in uh, the, in the Sand Hills, edge of the Sand Hills, Nebraska, near North Platte. Uh, he is also one of the co-founders of Sustainable Beef LLC. It's a packing facility there at North Platte, Nebraska, about 500,000 square feet, 1,500 head capacity, with a figure over a billion dollar economic impact. They suspect this will have on the community of North Platte, Nebraska, and Trey, am I right? North Platte, about 30,000 people. Is that right? The community there? Yep, exactly. About 29,000, yep. something like that. Yeah. So we're not talking a huge, huge community. I mean, good enough size, but by no means is it a huge community. And you were talking a little bit in the first or in the second segment there about the median income and, and the median wages and where you guys will be at. And it definitely it's going to be a huge economic boost to North Platte, Nebraska. And I know just in talking to you, I felt like a lot of the things you guys have really got a lot of the bases covered. And I think a lot of that has to do with the partners that you have uh, that are, are part of this deal of, of folks that have been involved in packing facilities and know what it takes to build these and so i i th- that was interesting to hear your conversation about housing and labor and, and all of those kinds of things let's get now into one of the other partners that has come into this deal uh and that being walmart they august 31st was announced of this last year that they're coming in as a minority stakeholder how did that happen <laughs> so um they reached out they know our another founder bill rupp and uh, Bill Rupp, you know, the former CEO of Cargill and, and uh, JBS Swift, they've done business together. They've known each other a long time. They've got a great relationship. Um, behind closed doors, a lot of retailers, the industry 
knew about this project mm-hmm. and a lot of attention around it. They love our story. They love our sustainability story, our family story, and what we're trying to do as a company and what we're trying to do for our community. And uh, Walmart really, really aligned with that. Uh, they like that. And and this is, you talked about North Platte being about 30,000. So I've had multiple people live there their entire life. And they've told me that North Platte has not grown in a census in over 40 years. Um, we've been about 30,000 head for about three decades and it has not changed. But our largest employer here in North Platte is Walmart. Um, we have a superstore here and we also have the Walmart distribution center here. So they're already have a huge presence in this community and they love it. And uh, for, for them to come forward as a minority uh, shareholder, they wanted not only the quality of beef, they want to improve their meat case and be one of the retail leaders in uh, high choice and prime Angus beef on their shelf that's raised by ranchers, uh, American ranchers. And um, they're willing to, uh, to get this project off the, off the ground and get it going. They were willing to make a, an investment into it as a minor, minority shareholder. And that's a, that's a big statement. I mean, you got the largest retailer in the world wanting to invest in rural America in a greenfield startup. Uh, that was a huge statement from them and their, and their team and something that rural America and Nebraska and the sand Hills and the beef industry should be proud of. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. And I have, and I, and I love their vision and you got to understand you, you want to sit with the winners, right? Um, that's what this is about. I'm, I, I need to learn a lot about the packing industry. I need to learn a lot about how the retailer and the consumer reacts. And, and that's, if you're in the business, they, they are writing us a check at the end of the day. Um, people don't think that, well, I mean, yeah, that is, I mean, it all runs downhill and that's just the way it works in the beef industry. And we need to listen I heard Bill Richel, uh, I bought his registered cow herd, and he told me, he said, if your customers want a purple polka dotted bull, build them one. Um, our job is to make what we think the industry needs, and our customers will tell us that. And so we build it to that. So, and if one of our first conversations we have with Walmart, like, what do you want from us? And they're like, we don't want you to change much at all. This is great. They came out here, visited our feed yard, they went through my calving barn. Um, they loved what we're doing here. It's just, they'd never even been told the story and, uh, they want to be a part of this and made a, made an investment to, to take, um, you know, they're going to take all the beef and it's going to be right here in the Midwest and something to be proud of. And, you know, I've taken a little flack. Um, <laughs> I want to be like Jimmy Kimmel, you know, when he read, uh, that Jimmy Kimmel, he'll have people, celebrities on there and they'll read bad tweets about yeah. themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> some Twitter. I don't even know. I don't even have Twitter, but I get people sending me they're like, wow, you know this guy? I'm like, no, I don't. But, um, I'm taking some flack on social media about it. And, uh, you know, my, my response to them is uh, they're calling us a sellout, which is not true. We're, we're still producer owned. We're exactly what we said we were. We're very transparent about what we're trying to do. The vision and goals the same. We've got somebody else that wanted to be a part of this that has the same goals. And my, my response to them is if you're in the cattle business, uh, if you're in the beef business, you're doing business with the large retailers already. If you don't think your beef is not ending up on their shelf, then um, I don't know what to tell you because you are. I mean, we are doing business with them every day. I don't care which retailer it is. They are our customer. I mean, so if you don't want to do business with them, you probably shouldn't be in the cattle industry because you are. Uh, that's just like the goal is to make our customers money all along the way. I mean, and so, uh, for Walmart to step up and say, we love this project. We love the morals and ethics and the people involved in the right place, the right time and the right people. We want to be a part of this. We want to see this come to fruition. How can we help? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I talked about the four C's earlier, you know, city, cattle, capital, and we added a four C. And that's consumption. Mm-hmm. And we need somebody to fill that void. And I think the world's largest retailer that's heavily invested, one of the largest employers in uh, Lincoln County, Nebraska already, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good marriage. So we're, we're, we couldn't be more happy to have them on board. You bet. Trey, you, you talked about the four C's just a, a moment ago and something that we didn't talk about earlier on. We've talked about the cost of building this facility, but 
that money just doesn't grow on trees out there or on or on the on the ears of the cattle out there. So, how do you come up with three hundred twenty-five million dollars? Well, maybe I should be asking you because it was probably <laughs> I told this is Pete Lapisotis, who's a founder and a cattle feeder. He told me right at the beginning. He said uh, raising the capital will be the hardest part because in agriculture we don't have any cash. I mean, we have assets, and you're not going to go to uh, you're not going to go to any large bank and be like, "Well, I got this ranch. I'd like to put up for this greenfield startup." Um, you know, that's just not going to happen. You're just not going to. And, and it, that's that's the truth. Are, are you going to leverage everything you have to get this done? Are you going to go out and sell the idea and raise the raise the money for this idea? And you know what? We talked to every cattle feeder I know. I went and sat at their kitchen table and told them this is what this is about. You can buy shackle space. You can you can put equity into the company. And you know what? Probably we we got about twenty feed yards hooked up. Um, that was our network because this didn't this project didn't fit everybody. Um, cattle feeders are not just like ranchers. They're not all created equal. Um, every Packer deal is different. And I learned that. And I'm going to be very uh, transparent about that. I was ignorant to that idea. I thought all cattle feeders were the same <laughs> until I sat down and talked to 50 of them. Did I realize how different we are? And this didn't fit some people's plan. And uh, but it but it fits, you know, our three founder cattle feeding families. It fit us to a T. And this is something we needed to be sustainable. And then also the people that can sign cattle. Um, we didn't get large feeders. We did. They've got a pack deal. They're they're taken care of. Um, we've got the small farmer feeders out there that have you know a thousand cows feed their own, and then when their own calves leave, they fill it with something else in the off season. And that that's that's who this fits. Now they have a place to kill their cattle, and that that's never been done before. And we're happy to supply that. And there's going to be premiums involved with that. Um, so was it hard? It's incredibly hard. No one could have ever prepared me how much work this could have taken. And David Briggs, our CEO, he's just a very, very responsible, um, well-liked. He's got a great demeanor about about him. He's not arrogant. He can walk into the room with some of the biggest players in the industry and go toe-to-toe with them. And that guy brought us to the promised land, in my opinion. He uh, He got the investments, and he got the capital raised, and got the capital stacked and allowed producers to maintain majority he is something else and we, the project wouldn't be here without him and uh it was incredibly hard but uh if you've got i heard elon musk on a podcast the other day is there asking him how much money he's buried into going to mars yeah. and they're like why are you doing this like why he's like well because i i can't go a day without thinking about it and all it's all it possesses me in my sleep and and during the day and i want to go and you'll do things if it's important enough for you, even though the chances of failure are high. If it's important enough for you, you'll see it through. And I just like it resonated with this me and this project and my team and the sustainability project as a whole. And this is important to us. This is important to us as a as a company. This is important to us as cattle feeders and cow calf producers and um, as a community and as, a, as an industry. And so we have the audacity to see it through. Mm-hmm. Well, Trey, uh, we're kind of short on time here, so as we as we get ready to leave here, I, as you're talking about all of this, I can't help but think, and, and I really, I guess I feel as, as I've heard you talk and, and how this has all happened and coming together and ground's already been broken, we're moving forward on it. Um, this is going to be interesting to see in about 15, 20 years for you to look back. Um, you're pretty young yourself and t- took a big task here. You and the other founders part of this whole deal took a huge, big task to take this on. And the story that can be written when we get 15 years down the road, I think you're going to look back on it and you'll just see, you'll see where there's been somebody else probably looking out over the top of some of these decisions that were made and things that happened. And um, I, I, I'm excited to see where this is going to lead. And I wish you guys the very best i think it's gonna be a a model for some other folks across the country as well and so i just wish you guys the very best as you're moving forward in this yeah thank you you know we're every every single cattle feeding family that's involved in this project has a second generation involved when i talked about earlier about how this didn't fit everybody it fit everybody you know the cassie lapisotis of the world um that said i want to do something different and uh that multi-generational story is 
something we're proud of and, and it, and it needed to change to be sustainable. Um, and this was our way of doing it. And so, uh, I'm proud of this team and I hope we can look back in 15 years and I hope we're still in business. I mean, we got a long road ahead of us, uh, but we got the right people, the right place in the right time, uh, to be successful. So. All right. Trey Wasserberger, my guest today, he and his wife, Dana, are uh, uh, ranchers out of North Platte, Nebraska, the TD Angus. If you want to find out more information about them, as we said earlier, they do have their uh, bull sale in March of every year. And uh, he, one of the ranching co-founders of uh, Sustainable Beef and all the partners involved in that. Trey, thank you for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And again, that was Trey Wasserberger, co-founder and rancher of Sustainable Beef out of North Platte, Nebraska. Just a couple information pieces I do want to pass along on this. First of all, uh, Trey does have a podcast site, and if you want to go and listen to his uh, his podcast, it's kind of for young entrepreneurs in agriculture. It's called Most of the Best, and you can follow along on his podcast. Another social site to be aware of is Sustainable Beef LLC. Yeah, they're on Facebook. You can go there, and you can follow along on Facebook and see kind of some of the progress that's happening happening with that facility as it's planning to get started in late 2024 I believe is when they hope to get that up and operational with a 1500 head capacity so we wish them the best going forward and a great story here to hear about that as I said with Trey just a moment ago I think that uh, it's also going to serve as a model potentially for some other uh, locations across the country that might want to be doing this as well as we have seen that need uh, definitely expanding a bit here in the last several years. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to take a look at our long-term weather as meteorologist Don Day joins us. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Cattle producers, here's a way to put more dollars in your pocket. Put the Amifirm advantage found in all gain smart mineral to work in your cow herd. Amifirm is the industry leader in increasing fiber digestion. In fact, research shows putting Amifirm to work increases forage utilization by 10%, reducing overall forage costs and allowing you to graze more animals per acre. That's a big time return on your investment. To find which gain smart mineral formula is right for your herd, visit gainsmart.com. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to PerformanceLivestockAnalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here as we're joined now by meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. And Don, you and I were kind of joking a little bit before uh, we went on air here about the fact that we just can't, this time of the year, it's not really good to be trusting those 7 to 10 day or even month long forecasts that are out there on your phones. Yeah, exactly. This is the time of year you can get in real trouble if you put too much faith uh, in that forecast that goes out five to 10 days. Not that people have a lot of faith in those forecasts anyway, but you'd be surprised yeah. because I hear from the people who get really angry. They'll say, well, you know, the long range forecast, it looked great and now it's changed. You know, why does it keep changing? What's what's going on? And I always have to remind people that um, uh, there's there's so much weather information available, whether it's on your phone or on the internet. And the the computer modeling some of it that we use is in the public domain and so it's out there for people to build websites and give folks a weather forecast that actually can go out to 15 days mm-hmm. um but the all the statistics show that once you get past day five the reliability uh the error rate is so high that uh It's just should be there should be a disclaimer on a long range forecast that says for entertainment purposes only. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and we were I was talking about the fact I was looking we're going to be shipping calves here this coming week and and looking at well it looks like it's going to be good. Oh no 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 it's going to be bad. No no now we're back to good weather. So uh, that kind of solidifies that whole segment of our conversation there. Let's look out say ten (laughs) fifteen and then as I say that then I ask you hey let's look out ten fifteen days. But and and 
I know you can't necessarily put your finger on anything specifically other than we know there is really, if we look at that Northern Hemisphere weather and you got a great, you have a great video on one of your podcasts last week about that, showing the, the weather from a, from some of the uh, ideas that could be happening in the next 10 to 15 days. What does that look like? I know we can't necessarily nail it down specifically, but what can we gather from that? Yeah, I mean, uh, what we can find in in long-term analysis is we can look at what the trends should be. Uh, And one thing that is really starting to come into play as we go into this new month is we're seeing two big things that we've seen historically that lead to cold weather in parts of North America. And that is what we call a blocking pattern, where you get a big area of high pressure that develops across the North Atlantic and goes all the way up into Greenland. And then we're seeing another blocking pattern developing where you get another big high pressure ridge that develops uh, over the Eastern Pacific. And when we're getting now into the month of December, where the jet stream gets stronger, we're getting into that winter season where the jet stream can kind of Um, get into a position where it can kind of be stuck for a while. And if you think of those high pressure systems as two bookends, you got a book into your West, you've got a book into your East. And what happens is the Arctic air that builds up over those Northern latitudes has got nowhere to go. It's kind of stuck between those bookends. And so what ends up happening is you get these Arctic waves that come out of Canada, um, where you you get into a pattern that more often than not is colder. Mm. And we see these blocking patterns getting established in previous winters, similar to this one, where North America, Canada, the lower 48 states, but also into Europe, and then also into eastern areas of Asia, where you tend to get these pockets of cold air that can be persistent. And that's what we're looking at in the month of December, uh, is that overall... December is looking like a cold month for, I would say, all of the United States, most of, with the exception maybe of the far southeast, but even places like Florida could have some cold periods. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Don, thanks for that. Uh, Always interesting and always very educational to hear, hear from you. Appreciate you joining us here today. Thanks for having me. And again, that was meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. His website can be found at dayweather.com. You can also find the link there to his daily video podcast that's on YouTube. Now, we are creeping up on Christmas, so if you're thinking you might be looking for something weather-related for a Christmas gift for someone this year, be sure to check out his website as well. Well, stay with us. Coming up next, we're going to talk about what's coming up on next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. We'll be back after this. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Coming up on next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show, we're going to be joined by a couple veterinarians as we talk about the impact of guidance number 263. Well, what is that? Well, that's the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's new directive to bring all over-the-counter drugs under veterinary oversight. They plan to implement that in June of 23. We're going to talk about it on next week's show. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers to start your subscription go to their website at workingranchmag.com if you'd like to get a hold of me my email is justin.workingranch at gmail.com thanks for joining us i'm your host justin mills and until next time keep your chin down and your mind in the middle so long (laughs) 